grace and peace, family and friends. I greet you once again in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am Tavares Stevens, one of the associate pastors at St. James UMC in Alpharetta, Georgia, where our senior pastor is the Reverend Dr. Gregory S. Williams. I greet you brimming once again with excitement as we land on this day. We land on this day after two previous days of navigating through our King celebration and examining the theme, where do we go from here, visions of beloved community. And prior to today, we experienced dynamic conversation and dialogue with pastors from the North Georgia area who, who believe in this dream of beloved community and believe that we can be that. And so we engaged in conversations where they talked about some tactics tactile ways that we can become that beloved community. Then, of course, we moved to yesterday where we experienced our annual King celebration. And that celebration was an incredible fusion of art and dialogue and exploration that represented every generation of our community. And it was culminated by a dynamic speaker, Artist Stevens, who reminded us that our legacy and our leadership and our commitment to togetherness of, and community are palpable ways that change occurs in this world. And so now we land here today on this third day where we prepare to experience bridging the gap racial reconciliation through worship and fellowship. We're going to experience a snapshot of a dynamic men's summit that was held back in November of 2020 when men from Alpharetta UMC and Mount Pisgah UMC, as well as St. James UMC convened, came together put on a summit that ended up drawing nearly 150 men from nearly 12 different states across the country to spend six consecutive hours on Zoom in large groups and small groups wrestling with those questions that make the Levitt community a challenge, but deciding to live into that challenge and make it a reality. And in the midst of that time, we had special guests, Reverend Dr. Crawford Loritz, as well as special guests, the Reverend Dr. Rand Andy Ross, and we had an incredible conversation with the senior pastors of St. James UMC and Alpharetta First UMC, as well as Mount Pisgah UMC, as they talked about the ways that we right here in our community can be that beloved community that God calls us to be. And so without further ado, I present to you our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Gregory S. Williams who will continue walking us into this moment where we find out ways that we can be a part of God's divine plan of bridging the gap. Good afternoon, my friends. My name is Dr. Gregory S. Williams. I am the senior pastor here at St. James United Methodist Church. I am excited today to take this opportunity to welcome you to our 2020 Bridging the Gap Men's Summit. This summit was originated with three churches coming together through the power of the Holy Spirit to create and to organize a Bible study to discuss the issue of race. These three churches are uh, St. James, Alpharetta First, and Mount Pisgah. These three churches sat down together, men of God, and they studied uh, the scriptures, read the Bible, and out of that, they put together and playing this 2020 summit. So friends, today I am happy, I'm excited because I believe that God is gonna use this summit to bring men together from all over this country to discuss the issue of race. I believe that we can live together, work together as brothers and sisters in Christ. So once again, I wanna take this opportunity to welcome you to the 2020 Bridging the Gap Men's Summit. Once again, welcome and God bless each of you. I want to take you back to a moment in 2013 when God went ahead of us as we moved from Northwest Atlanta up to St. Louis uh, for a big job change. That summer, August 9th, uh, 2014 to be exact, St. Louis erupted in violence. Mike Brown had been fatally shot about 20 minutes from where we lived in Ferguson, which is now kind of the household name. Armored police met with protesters in the street 
And I remember sitting there very vividly watching TV and the news broadcasts, just wondering why people were so angry at each other. Looking back, I never thought of myself as a racist at all, but I definitely wasn't an anti-racist. I just didn't get it. As I rode my bike around St. Louis, I found a street called Del Mar. And what I came to know is the Del Mar Divide. On the one side of the street, well done houses, literally on the other side of the street, complete shacks. Turns out on the north side, it's 99% black, 75,000 home value, 10% college education. Literally on the other side of the street, 73% white, $350,000 home value, 70% college educated. That doesn't happen by accident, and it doesn't happen overnight. This summer, five years after that, the conversation about race came to the forefront again as George Floyd died. And as a senior leader in my company, responsible for over half of our employees, again, we had the choice. Do we talk about it? Do we not talk about it? This could get awkward. We definitely don't. Even as much as it's tough to talk it in church, it's even tougher to talk without that common ground. But we chose to talk about it. We hosted a panel. We asked questions like, what are you feeling? What are you hoping for? What do you hope that this changes? In that one hour, our company culture changed. Conversations that were previously taboo, now completely accepted and encouraged. And we're often having those type of conversations in our one-on-ones um, throughout the company. Church, if you don't think we play a role uh, in building unity, you're mistaken. God looks at us as broken, as messed up as we are through that lens of Jesus. And in turn, we should look at, um, if we're, when we're focused on Jesus and solely focused on Jesus, then all these this tough parts of the conversation, the baggage, um, the barriers, they come down, the baggage gets left at the door. And... Uh, we focus on relationship building, not relationship breaking. I'm often asked, what did it feel like and how did you react and respond to the George Floyd killing? And I can tell you this, it was deja vu all over again. A friend of mine was killed in a similar fashion in Miami, Florida in 1980 actually in 1979, but in 1980, it ended up with the most violent riot in the history of the country to that point. Arthur McDuffie, Google it, McDuffie Riots, Miami. On the afternoon of May 17th, 1980, I was the eyewitness to the violence that occurred in Miami, Florida as a result of the killing of Arthur McDuffie and uh, the jury verdict that was announced that Saturday afternoon. Um, it was one of the most horrific scenes that I can remember in my lifetime. I was 17 years old and uh, it was a shock to see what unfold that afternoon. But it was all a result of uh, the violence that occurred was because of the injustice that had been handed down by a jury uh, that had hid evidence um, and also uh, in, in, injustice was handed down uh, to his family. And so it boiled over into rage and uh, resulted in one of the most horrific uh, situations that's imaginable with people getting killed and National Guard being called in and uh, buildings burning, people being shot and killed. Uh, I remember I was working uh, at the hospital at 17, uh, it was all a shock. And it was one where I got stuck there overnight uh, for two days and ultimately had to have the police come and escort me home because the National Guard was called out. There was buildings burning, cars overturned, um, looting, uh, people being shot and killed. I, I personally witnessed a person being uh, gunned down in uh, about 300 feet in front of my house. Uh, and it was just an amazing um, thing to experience at that age to see the, the rage that occurs when injustice uh, is continuously poured out to a group of people. And that's ultimately what we had. Arthur McDuffie, 
stand up man, the kind of friend that you had back in school. You know the guy that could do anything? The guy that was not the captain of the football team, but everybody respected him because he was professional and everything. No police record, Marine, veteran, entrepreneur, person you look up to. Was murdered, beat to death by eight Miami City policemen and his murder was covered up only to be discovered after one of the officers confessed to the killing. An all-white, all-male jury in Tampa, Florida acquitted the officers of all charges. And the result is what happens when peaceful voices go unheeded. Um, one of the things <clears throat> that you spoke about in your, your, your message was um, you know, courageous confrontation, being courageous in our confrontation. And so, um, and so we, we, we'd love for you, like with using, even using what we just saw as a setup to kind of take us back to November, to, um, to remind us of, of what you delved into when you mentioned that about being, about being courageous in confrontation. Yeah. You know, I almost that 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 the emotions of all of that just trigger everything in us, doesn't it? You know, you just think about uh, them covering that up and this deja vu all over again. I mean, 1980, fast forward 2020. I mean, you know, the same same deal. Um, you, you know, there's a context here, though. I, I think that um, these things that happen, particularly happen to us people of color. Um, to say that we feel them deeply is an understatement, you know, because it it just it just reaches back into all of our history, and uh, and once again it just conjures up in our hearts and minds that um, our well being is optional, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, it as it as severe as a murder to you know just the everyday slights and overlooking and this kind of thing. The message is uh, you're not you're not valuable, mm. and it's an attack on the dignity, and and really it's an attack on the image of God that is indelibly written on every soul. Uh, to say that who God created is not worth very much, and mm. so that's what sometimes um, our brothers and sisters. Uh, um, in the white community don't always understand the profound, deep feelings. And here we have this happening all, all over again. In my comments, um, you know, I think as I recall, I spoke from just uh, four perspectives that we need to mm -hmm. embrace in order to bridge the gap here. But these cannot be just uh, superficial things. They, they require profound commitment. And we've got to be committed to these four things. And, mm -hmm. and the, the fourth one was courageously confront. The other three were uh, that we need to think of ourselves as being the portraits of the, of the destination at which we need to arrive, particularly if we name the name of Christ. We're part right. of the church of Jesus Christ, and we're left here in the world to be a picture and a portrait mm. of what the world needs to become. Mm. And, uh, and then secondly, you know, we need to live out our destination. Um, um, well, that's the first, we need to live out our destination. But the second is we need to live out our identity, I, I should say. Yeah. And uh, that is that we are reconciled people. Reconciliation is something that has already taken place. Now we have to live that out. You know, that's Ephesians chapter two, the wall has mm -hmm. been broken down. The pathway has been set, and every person that names the name of Christ, we've we've been reconciled. But the problem is that we don't live out that reconciliation. And, and I think I use the illustration my dad used to say to me as <laughs> and to all his sisters, and he used to say to me all the time uh, uh, when they were going out here. My mother he used to say to me, "Now look, boy, there's a babysitter here, and when I come back, I don't want to hear no nonsense. All right, you need to remember that your last name is Loritz." meaning that the relationship should change the behavior. That's right. The relationship <laughs> changes the behavior. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's what we typically forget. And the third thing I said, I think I said, is that we, we can't love from a distance. 
we can't love from a distance. Loving from a distance is just theoretical. I mean, love, love means that I disadvantage myself for the benefit and blessing of another. Biblical love always involves sacrifice. And when Jesus says, by this, you'll know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another, that needs to be demonstrated. But now let's get to that fourth piece there. That fourth piece is uh, you need to courageously confront. And to confront what is wrong does not mean that you don't love. In fact, I would argue, I would argue to not confront means passive hatred. It is a passivity. It is, and an, an because love presses into doing that which is ultimately right, even if it's painful. That's the reason why you discipline your children, right? You discipline your children because you don't want to see them cry. You don't want to see them unhappy, but you don't want to visit them in jail either, do you? <laughs> you know, and, and you so you 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 press into doing what is difficult because it's not right, and not not just because it offends you, but because it damages. Interestingly enough, the offender. It cements them in a behavior that does not tell the truth about the dignity and the, and, and the identity and the image of God that's on them. And so for me to be passive means that, okay, I'm just gonna let you go ahead and be what you are. I'm gonna let you proceed down that road of self-destructive behavior. So I would argue that confrontation is one of the most incredibly um, uh, wonderful demonstrations of love, but it takes courage to do that. And so when Peter over in Galatians chapter two, this is, this, this is, I mean, Paul rather in Galatians chapter two, you know, the story there, uh, Peter, Peter, you know, had gotten that vision back in the book of Acts, you know, that, that whatever God cleansed, don't call it common or unclean. And God was preparing him. He said, now, look, you need to walk away. Uh, you've been looking down your Jewish nose at these Gentiles all these years, right? You, you've been kind of dissing them all this whole time. Guess what, Peter? Jesus died for those folks. And you're no better than they are. And so he gives them this vision to set him up, okay? But Peter struggled with some of this racism because by the time you get to Galatians 2, Paul says, okay, you know, you used to hang out with the Gentiles, right? You used to hang out with your Gentile brothers. You used to do that, right? But then when your deep pocket Jewish friends came along, right? These people in which you have a lot of affinity came along, you start pushing the rewind button. You start backstepping a little bit. And, and Paul in that text says, strong language in the Greek text, he confronted him to his face in front of them all. Because he said, and it's interesting, the passage says, because your behavior was not in step with the gospel. With the gospel. This is what you've been declared to be, buddy. So now you, you need to change your behavior. And I think, I think this, is, this is what gospel people do. You know, gospel people, gospel people, we realize that Jesus paid an ultimate price for our freedom and for our oneness. And so gospel people step up and say, you know, no, no, no. It's wrong to talk about people like that. It's wrong to have those policies on your job that, that disenfranchise folks. No, 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 it, it is wrong. It is absolutely wrong. There's no right about it for you to be making decisions and committing the sin of partiality with pigmentation. To me, that's what racism is all about. It's the sin of partiality with pigmentation. And you're committing that sin. And in the name of Jesus, it's wrong and you need to stop it. See, I think that it, when the Bible always always, always addresses sin in the context and atmosphere of a holy impatience. A holy wow. impatience. And, and that's the reason why we need to confront it. We need to confront it. You don't put up with it. You don't stomach it. You don't, you don't allow it to take place in your children. 
And I ain't just talking about white folks either. I'm talking about black folks. You know how we do too behind closed doors. We don't, <laughs> we don't let that happen either. So no, that's not true. And so we need to have, this is, this, this, this closes the book on all of this, you know, all this other stuff. Yeah. We can theoretically talk about love and we can talk about how we've been reconciled. You know, we can talk all about these things, but, but the truth of the matter is it, it only takes place when I put it in the verb position, all transformation eventually is in the verb position. I've got to do something. And so I think this is where we need to stand shoulder to shoulder as brothers and sisters in Christ. The other day. You know, all the mess that's, that's taken place in Washington and, and the attack on, uh, well, the insurrection, really, uh, uh, on, on the attack on the Capitol and all of this stuff. You know, I pastor a church that is multi-ethnic. And, uh, and so yesterday morning, I just stood up and said to our people, you know, this is a hot mess. This is an amazing thing. This is the, I, I never thought I would live to see the day where we would have this kind of incredible meltdown in, 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 in our, in our country and disrespect. And so, you know, so I said to the people, I said, now I've been trying to get my heart and mind around all of this, but there are four questions that I feel like we all need to answer. These four questions are these number one, will I love? Will I love? Will I love? And I don't mean cheap sentiment. Will I really love? And underneath that love, uh, that question comes, means that will I show forgiveness? Will I show mercy? All of these things. The second question that I raise is, will I give myself to that which is most important? And that happens to be the fulfillment of the Great Commission, the lostness of people, the sinfulness that folks are caught up in. Jesus is the solution. Am I going to give myself to that priority? And, and then the third question is what I've already said is, will I do the hard work of modeling what the culture needs to become? Will I do that? We well, see, that's the Bible. The Bible, uh, the only reason why the peoples of God are left in the world, whether it's the Jews in the Old Testament, whether it's the church today, it's not, it's not for some consumer mindset and that, that I'd be the best version of who I am and you know claim my destiny and uh, my purpose and all of this other kind of hyper individualistic stuff. The reason why the peoples of God are left in the world is that we're to be the portraits of the desired destination at which the culture needs to arrive. So that, so that reconciliation and diversity, they're not hobbies. They're not interesting side gigs. It's, it's the core. It's the core of the gospel. And so am I willing to, to be that? But then the fourth one I said is this, and this is where the rubber meets the road. Will I give myself to speaking out against evil and wickedness wherever it is? Will I do that? And that's not a contradiction to love. In fact, as we've said before, it is the expression of love. It's not about me personally. It is about what is, God has declared was objectively right and objectively wrong. So these are the questions that I think we need to wrestle with and really is, is sort of like the rationale behind confronting that which is evil and wrong. So. That it's not that it's not that Christians cannot vote for a Democratic candidates or Republican candidates or independent candidates or that kind of thing. However, we don't do that out of context. Uh, we we are everything. We we don't have the privilege of a la carting our Christianity. Meaning meaning that I I just sort of push this aside and compartmentalize myself. Um, Followers of Jesus Christ, we live within the context of revealed revelation. I mean, the revelation of scripture. Uh, that is our framework. Um, we belong. We belong to that, that glorious kingdom. We belong. We, we are kingdom people. We, we are members of the body of Christ. And so these, these matters, these matters um, should encase 
how we approach every bit of engagement in society, how we think about it and this kind of thing. And that, that we don't give ourselves to being used by Republicans or Democrats or independents. No, now we might come together and, and support certain issues that represent kingdom issues to us that wherever they might be, but we must never, ever, ever abdicate our identity for the sake of any system in this society. We're called to be salt and light to them. They're not called to be salt and light to us. And you can't impact that which you're unduly impressed with. It will always change you. And so you, you, have, to, you have to realize that, that, so when I say that we're people of the third option, Christianity is not just one plank of my identity. It is my identity. It is my identity, not part of who I am. It infiltrates and, and, and delightfully contaminates everything about me. And I can't bifurcate that. I, I can't separate that. I can't get away from that. I, I belong to Jesus in every sense of the word. My thinking, my responses, all of that. So when I say that we're people of the third option, that's what I mean. We transcend these other things. Now, we might go with you because you, you go with the Bible on certain issues and how we feel. And, uh, you know, and, and so I'm, what I'm, not, I'm not saying that every Christian needs to be a Democrat, every Christian needs to be a Republican, or every Christian needs to be independent. I think that we have very convictions. We need to respect that. But we operate from the context of who we belong to. Rather than the traditional final word in a moment like this, what, what I'd love to ask mm. you to do, Dr. Lewis, is, is let that final word be a word of prayer Amen. for Amen. The, the men who are watching. Mm. And, and also because of the way that this emanation of the broadcast occurs, it's, it's not now just, just the men, because as we repackage the whole um, mm. November event, we've opened it up so that everyone can see Oh my. What yeah. what transpired that day. And so mm -hmm. um so we're thinking about the men who were gathered, but we're thinking about their families and yes. their communities and their churches. And we just ask that you offer a word of yeah. prayer yeah. For, for each of each of us. Oh yeah, let's let's do that. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we bow before your presence because Lord, uh we not only do we have nowhere else to go, we don't want to go anyplace else. You have everything that we need, Father. You have our, our lives in your hand. Lord, you know the promises and the plans and all of that stuff that have been set aside for each one of us. And God, we pray that we will walk in those things today. I pray that every person watching this or listening to it, Lord, will, will uh, receive hope and a sense of direction and encouragement, profound encouragement, Father, that, uh, Lord, uh, they will be delightfully engaged with who you are. And, Father, that their hearts will be drawn, Lord, not only to your word, but to what you want to do in and through each one of us, in our spheres of influence, on our jobs, in our communities, in our families, as we raise our children, interact with our spouses, or, or in other primary relationships. Lord God, grant hope, grant encouragement. And then we do pray for the church. We also pray for the body of uh, the body of Christ uh, uh, broadly, but also for our country. We pray that you will visit us, oh God, that you will give us a moment in history. Bring repentance and wholeness, we pray. Thank you, God, for what you will do. And thank you, Father, for the joy of knowing you. In Jesus' name, amen. with the uh, elephant in the room that I am a white male and I have lived a life of all of the privilege that is attached to that and efforts towards this understanding of bridging a white, so to speak, an African-American gap has had to be intentional for me. And um, I've had to get out of my own way of privilege and that has had to be intentional. Uh, my cultural, cultural awakening really is my mo best memories are of two things in particular. Um, the beginning of it really was in ninth grade, for some reason, I picked up the book, The Autobiography of Malcolm X by Alex Haley. And I've since read it multiple other times. And I don't know why I picked that book up when I was 14 years old, 
but it really stuck with me and resonated with me. And in terms of beginning to understand an African-American experience from an African-American point of view, and my experience really needed to be a literary one um, because that's just the, what I had access to. Uh, and my second was when I was in college, um, I had a professor that eventually became kind of my adopted mentor. And I was, it was such a formative time for me academically, intellectually, culturally. And that was the second part of my cultural awakening. Um, and then as I've been an adult, the, I've tried to read up on issues and there have been so many issues I've read on or watched documentaries on about um, injustices within the African-American community, whether it's financial injustice, education injustice, um, uh, problems with, this, with the judicial and legal system, um, access to jobs, healthcare, the whole story. I've tried to educate myself as best I can to understand what that experience looks like because it has not been mine. Uh, and ultimately we land today right now and the why are we in this moment right now to actually do something and accomplish something. And I think the, the benefit of right now um, in a national sense is that the issues that some people outside the African American community have been allowed to ignore for so long and dismiss as if it's not really accurate, it's now front and center and it can't be ignored or overlooked anymore as that's really not the reality. And it's a reality that we really have to own and face as a nation. And the place to begin some kind of change to me is in small groups like our churches that have begun the conversation and are now continuing that conversation. And hopefully out of our churches and out of our group dialogue will come um, a broader awakening and broader efforts to really bridge the gap and make that gap disappear. And that's what I'm prayerful happens. I think basically uh, we have a biblical responsibility to call out injustice and not just call it out and then walk away but to be engaged in terms of transformation that it cease and desist. Uh, mm. Some of the images that I've seen in the media have broken my heart again. Yeah. But I will say this, uh, and I've had this conversation with several of our staff people and our leaders. Uh, all injustice uh, is sin. Racial injustice that we're experiencing, that is in proximity in our community, mm. in our workplaces, in our schools, mm. uh, that's, that's ours to deal with. Mm. It's ours to address. It's ours to engage in. And uh, my heart particularly is grieved back to the police interaction of all the cases I see, especially of young black males yeah. being mistreated uh, and mistreated is a kind word to describe mm. what we've seen uh, and to experience that kind of abuse. It's unacceptable. And so the challenge is how do we move from I guess the first part is the recognizing and the acknowledgement, this is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And then moving to, all right, how do we move towards ac uh, acceptability? And uh, how do we as the church exert our influence uh, with uh, civic county governmental leaders? You know, uh, Pastor Williams, you know, we've we've had some interesting conversations even around race. Yes, and, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. There's a there are times where you walk into spaces as, you know, Reverend Dr. Gregory Williams. And, and there's a way that you receive when you walk in with folks knowing that. But then there are those times where you are Gregory Williams the man navigating through the community. Mm, yes. And when you see these kinds of things, you know, as, as Pastor Wood talks about working with civic leaders, but then knowing that there's this 
this personal reality that you live yourself where there are circumstances where the title doesn't even get brought up. It's just what kind of thoughts go through your mind as you, as you think about what Pastor Woods, Pastor Wood just walked us into? If I can add to uh, that uh, question, for me, I was home about uh, two months ago, and a friend of mine said to me, who was a white guy, he said, what about George Floyd? He said, man, he was killed, and uh, I think he was having a bad day, and uh, cops, he was having a bad day. I had to pause because I said to myself, you have really missed the point. So I said to him, I said, uh, Mr. So-and-so, hmm. I said, uh, there are some things in life that's right, and there are some things that's wrong. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you put your knee on a neck of a person, and they yelled out, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. There's nothing right about that. And for me, I believe the church, we need to just wake up. Mm. We can pray together, worship together, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But if we can't see that racism is wrong, that is evil, that it divides people. And here's what I've learned over the years. People say black people are racist. We cannot be racist. Mm. We can be prejudiced, but we cannot be racist. Racism is a system that is mm. designed to keep people down, in check, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, I believe that we can transform the uh, world only if we learn to love each other, work together, mm. and we have to own up to the fact that we have a problem. Mm -hmm. right. So right. if we can't say there is a race problem, we can worship together, dance together, shout together, whatever we, mm -hmm. we want to call it. <laughs> but we're just worshiping together. Yeah. So I, I believe that we can change the world, but we must first come to the conclusion that we have issues. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think for me, uh, Ahmaud Arbery's situation really um, struck home. And uh, I've, got, I've got four kids. My oldest son, his best friend's black. Mm. They've been friends since they were four, best friends probably shortly after there. And their family, uh, they've, become, they've become family for right. us. And when I was telling my kids about Ahmaud Arbery, uh, I was thinking about Jaden. And um, the the reality hit me that as a, as a white man with white kids, life's different. Mm -hmm. and, and I explained it to my kids this way. It would be as if Jaden were running through our subdivision just for exercise. And he was targeted because of his skin color um, versus Braden you running through our subdivision just to get exercise and everybody leaving you alone. And I think that's when some things really started to stir, of course, with George Floyd um, and, and his killing. That's when I reached out to um, Dr. McQueen and mm -hmm. said, hey, mm -hmm. we've got to do something about this and we need to talk about this because there's a perspective that as a white person, we have to learn that we don't have and we won't have unless we have a relationship. And so I think when you talk about the change that has to happen because of what happened this spring and summer, I think it's only possible through the conduit and the context of relationship. Right, right. But the, the, the work we can do in advance for situations like that are going to lead to solutions and resolution. And so it's, it's great to get in a Bible study because then you get the relationship <laughs> And that's when right. you get in the relationship, then Amart Arbery is not some, somebody that's in another city or another town. It's somebody that you know. George right. Floyd is somebody that you know. And, and when you're in relationship, you start to real, realize commonality. There are differences, but the same struggles, the same fears, the same hopes, the same dreams that you share. So it starts at that relational level. And then I think it moves to the, 
institutional level. And as pastors of the gospel, we know Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. racism is a manifestation of a sin nature. Mm. And the only Mm. solution for a sin nature is a spiritual nature that comes through the gospel. So Mm. we have to be intentional about preaching that and equipping people to, to name, as you said, to name evil as evil and to give them the solution, which is Jesus Christ and the spirit of God that brings about transformation and then lock arms together through partnerships and relationships with other churches to where true change can take place. Prior to coming to Alpharetta, I was a part of a pastor's network in Northern Gwinnett County that actually extended to all Gwinnett County that partnered with one race movement Mm. to where we helped organize and put together a march on the mountain, Stone Mountain. We had about two hours of just confession and repentance. I think you got to start there. That's right. Start with the self, start with the institutional racism and, and repent and seek the Lord. And we spent the rest of the day worshiping together on the lawn of Stone Mountain. And what was amazing about that is, is that was a community of churches, not just that started in North Gwinnett, but expanded to the county, then to the state. And we had pastors coming in from all over the nation to say what had been landmarked as a place of racism Right, but was spoken about as a, as a promise or a dream. That's right, that's right, that's right. To, to say, we're gonna, we're gonna break down the stronghold through repentance, through the power of Jesus, and through the power of the community of faith. I think the church can actually transform the uh, world if we put our faith first. The problem that I see mm. with the church sometimes is we put our color and Politics before our faith. Mm. Some people are white first, black first, then Christian second. Mm. That's backwards. Mm. We need to be Christian first. And I think out of that, everything else would actually flow. Mm. As our planning team was putting this together, they said, well, as you're sitting with our pastors, can you ask this question about how the love of Christ can confront the segregation even that still takes place on Sundays, mm. you know, <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and they were like, please just like that has to come across because we want the world to hear our response as believers as to how we can navigate through what is a challenge for us at times, but also think about the kind of example that we might be for the world. And so Pastor Wood, I'll, I'll start with you on that question. Mm. Well, I wish I had a really short and good answer to that. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, but I don't. But I. But I will say this, um, in light of what my brothers have shared, um, in a spirit of confession, I think yes, Sunday is a, a terribly segregated hour at whatever hour you worship. But also consider this, even within the Christian community. Mm. Uh we get together and we worship together occasionally. We had lunch a week or two ago. It was wonderful. But we do not intentionally pursue relationships. Right. Wow, wow. Yeah. So we've got a segregation there. In other words, we want to come at it and say, yeah, uh, I got a pastor friend, Pastor Williams, so on and so forth. And we seem to stop at a relationship that's this deep when the opportunity is down here. Yeah, right. yeah. And yeah. him hearing my story. Wow. And me hearing his story. And us sharing our insecurities and uh, sharing our vulnerabilities. David mentioned uh, the gift of perception. Mm. Well, my perception is incomplete. Uh, unless you're speaking into my life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. And yes. so when the Ahmaud Arbery situation unfolded and uh, then some other things happened and the heat got turned up in terms of the social unrest closer to home in Metro Atlanta. Right. Um, we had a whole group of people who said we need to respond. And I said, yes, we do. And they said, well, let's reach out. Uh, yeah, let's reach out to St. James. Mm. All right, 
And in that moment, it occurred to me, I love St. James. I mm. love many of the people at St. James. Mm. I love the fact that they, Michael invited me to come over there and I preached. Mm. But you know what hit me? Why have we waited? Mm -hmm. Right. Why have we waited until now, now. <laughs> to then go to St. James and say, we want to be helpful, can you help us? And so I'm not vilifying anyone. Right, I'm right. just saying I felt a tremendous sense of conviction yeah. that this is a relationship that should have been cultivated all along the way. Because wow. what, I'm, what I hope everyone who's watching us understands is that the reason why we are here is because there were a few people mm -hmm. who already have authentic relationship, who in the midst of prayer groups they're in together, in the midst of just conversations they have because they check on each other, because they have authentic relationships that said, we can intentionally do better. And so, so Pastor Williams, I, if you would just lean even more into this idea of what authentic relationship does to keep transforming us so that God keeps moving in the world. I actually think in order for us to heal, mm. we have to be transparent. Okay. I was home the other day and my son came home and he said, Dad, he said, there is a beautiful young lady. I knew where he was going. He said, she's cute. I said, well, wonderful. And then he paused and he said, but she is Caucasian. Do you have a problem with that? And I quickly said to him, no. And he picked up on something. Mm. He said, but daddy, you stalled. Ah. I said, no, sweetie. I said, it's not because I have a problem with the young lady. I said, I have a problem with the things that you would face in the world. Mm. Mm. I said, now, in terms of who you love, I don't care what color, et cetera, et cetera. Change. It starts in my house, mm. then your house. One house at a time. When I came here today, you said, welcome, Pastor. Rita was at the door. She said, hi, Pastor. Michael Jordan said, Welcome. I felt the love. Yeah. People know when people are phony, when they're not being real. And people always say black people have a problem with police. We don't like the police. We don't have a problem with the police. Right. We have right. a problem with you on our necks for over eight minutes. I know what it's like to be driving in Peachtree City. And a cop just pulled me over and say, hey, was I speeding, sir? No. We're taught how to survive. We're taught how to deal with cops. Keep both hands on the wheel. Do not reach down. Wait till they come to the window. Yes, ma'am. No, sir. May I please reach down? We're taught from birth how to survive. Mm. Change begins with us one house at a time. People say we have a problem with quote unquote Trump. I don't have a problem with Trump. When I was a kid, there was something ab a about the office. I would be in the yard playing, and they'll say, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, I would stop. There was something about the dignity of the office. Yeah. Where you don't have a president saying, lock them up. Lock them up for protesting because we feel as though we treat it like second-class citizens. Mm. And the White House, the highest office in the world. Why can't he say, let's sit down together, talk together. I feel your pain. I understand. But yet he uses racism to divide. We can talk until we blew in the face, but here's the conclusion of it for me. Yeah. Until we look deep in our spirits and come to the conclusion that all men and women are made in the image of God, yeah. there are certain rights that's in our constitution, 
that we are endowed by our Creator for certain basic and unalienable rights. And among those rights are life, liberty, justice, and the pursuit of happiness. So when black people are marching and protesting, we're not stupid. We know what it's like to be discriminated against. We know what it's like to have to work harder. We know what it's like to walk in a room and the power to get a job. You're at the mercy of certain people. We know what it's like to live in a neighborhood and you better not run with a hoodie. We know what it's like to have your kids leave the house and you have to pray that they come back home safely. So I would say to all of my Christian friends, those of us, quote unquote, who say we love Jesus, Hmm. love the Lord your God with all your heart, et cetera, et cetera, and your neighbor as yourself. We can say we love God, but until we love, value, and respect our neighbor. Wow, wow. it, it, It pains me that my son is afraid when he's driving and he said, dad, there is a sheriff behind me. Yeah. And he gets nervous and I look in his eyes and see the change in the spirit. That's painful to me Mm. because I feel that way. And then just hearing the, the experience with police. I mean, look, I get nervous when the police is behind me. If I get pulled over, I'm pretty convinced it's because I did something wrong. And so even in hearing the story, like I teach my kids, I've got one driver, one about to be driver. I'm like, hey, if you get pulled over, this is what you do. But the difference is I don't come from the nervousness because right. of my skin color. And I think that's, that's the breakdown. And that's got to change. And the, the only way we can do that is, is through moving through the, the, the relationships, the local level, the corporate um, connection between the churches. Because we can't get there to a place where we're all just going to be nervous when a police gets behind us just because we're wondering if we did something wrong and we're getting pulled over, not because of the skin color. Wow. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, Acts 1-8, you shall receive power. I believe that the church, we can do anything that we want to because we have the power to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm. I believe the church has the power to do what the church wants to do through the power of Christ. The church must come to the conclusion that we have issues. We cannot be afraid to deal with those issues. The church must come to the conclusion that we're not like the world. Mm. We are part of it. But we can be different from it. That's right. That's right. When I came here today, there was something about this church today from the time I pulled in. Thank you for that lovely and warm. He said, come on around. Park right here. Yeah. When I walked in, I felt the love. People just want to be loved. And I think that if the church faced the real issues, racism is real. And if we are not afraid to go there and just let the Holy Spirit lead us. Now, that's the key right there. Mm. We don't always have to know how to do it. Just like the men, they just jumped in. (laughs) That's right. And the Holy Spirit took over. And here we are. That's God. Family and friends, we pray that you have been moved and stirred and inspired thus far. We pray that your thoughts have been provoked by the vignettes that you have heard throughout this presentation. We pray that your your mind and your spirit have been moved as wisdom flow forth from Dr. Crawford Loritz. We pray that you are seeing community, beloved community, breaking out around us as you listened and you heard the stories and the dialogue that Pastor Gregory Williams shared and, and, and Pastor Steve Wood shared and Pastor David Walter shared. And we're praying right now, family, that your hearts and your minds are ready to receive the Reverend Dr. Randy Ross as he helps us land at a point where we realize that in fact, that hope can rise as he walks us into the final moments of bridging the gap. Jim, 
gentlemen, I'm going to suggest to you that there is an eternal trilogy that we need to embrace as we sort of culminate our conversation today. I want to take you to the simple trilogy that I think can sustain our efforts as we try to move forward together in unity. And I want to suggest a very simple outline to you this afternoon. And that's simply this, that faith unifies. Hope amplifies and love multiplies. And so here's what I want you to ponder for just a minute, that, that peace is the emotional result of faith. Joy is the emotional result of hope. And love is the expression of them both. Right now, our society is going through convulsions. There is social unrest, there is racial tension, there is a lack of peace in our world today. And I believe it's because we've not done an effective job in trying to communicate our faith. Joy is lacking on many fronts. As a matter of fact, of the globe I've often described recently, I think the, the globe and particularly America itself is, is going through what I call a low grade depression. We've been bombarded by circumstances that have taken the wind out of our sails. And uh, while we may be able to go about our daily activities and fulfill our responsibilities, none of us really feels like we're functioning at our best. We're not at our peak performance. There's just something to miss. And maybe it's time for us to lean into hope so that our joy might be restored. And love is the expression of both faith and hope. And those three form an eternal trilogy that is powerful for they are intricately intertwined. But as we culminate our conversation today, I want you to think about faith as a unifying factor for all of us. Faith unifies. Think for just a moment about those things in life or in society that have the power to unify. There, there aren't very many. There, there are few and far between. I mean, it's very obvious that politics will never unify our country. We've moved, unfortunately, from divisiveness to acrimony. Our country has never been more politically divided. It's never been more challenging to step out of an echo chamber and try to cross boundaries to hear the other side. We, we seem to be fighting more against each other than we're fighting for anything. Positions change with the blowing of the wind just so that some side says that they haven't lost. Politics will never unify us. Governmental institutions and agencies will never unify us. Economic manipulation will never unify us. Social media will never unify us. Philanthropic causes will not unify us. Rhetoric won't unify us. Rioting will not unify us. As a matter of fact, we learned just a minute ago, sports won't even unify us, right? Because we all have our own angles. I came on early this morning and I was wearing an Alabama pullover and Moses Hardy chastised me. He said nobody would listen to me if I was wearing an Alabama pulley, pullover, so I had to go change clothes before I even brought this presentation. Sports won't unify us. Brothers, there's nothing that's going to unify us except our faith. And here's the passage from Ephesians chapter 4 that I want you to think about. Christ himself gave us the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his body for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. If you want to find the unifying factor, it's our faith. There is nothing else that will bring us together to join hands together and hearts together in bonds of brotherhood as our faith. And Paul knew that. And after having written in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 about 
the diversity within the body, but the body being one. Now he gives us this challenge and he says, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the son of God and become mature. Maturity demands unity. Without unity, there is immaturity. And he says this, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, Paul, in his own way, uh, Paul was extremely diplomatic, but I, I'm not going to be quite so gentle. You know, this, this morning, Crawford challenged us to be courageous in our confrontation. And so I think this is what Paul was saying. He was saying, grow up. Just grow up. If we're not unified, we're immature. Without unity, there is immaturity. Grow up to the full measure of what we've been called to do in Christ Jesus. Our faith and only our faith has the capacity to unify us. Beyond that, hope amplifies. The passage that I want to refer you to is found in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. It says this, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Remember, peace is the emotional result of faith. Joy is the emotional response to hope. May the God of hope fill you with how much? All all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow. There's the amplification that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy spirit. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. He goes on to say Romans 12 chapter 12. So there are four elements of hope that I want to suggest for you today four common beliefs, four foundational ways of thinking, four corners of our faith when it comes to this aspect of hope. And, and I want to lay those out and I want to talk about each one of those for just a minute. Because here's, here are the four elements of hope that I want you to consider. First is positivity. And positivity just simply says this, that, that my future can be brighter than today. And that's simply because I don't know what my future holds, but I certainly know who holds my future. And, and God is the designer of my destiny. And then no matter what challenges I may be experiencing today, I know that tomorrow can be brighter because my God is in control. My future can be brighter than today. And listen to this. Even on my dying day as a believer I know that my tomorrow will be brighter. That's the promise we have of eternity. That on our dying day, our tomorrow can be brighter. So if on our dying day, our tomorrow can be brighter, then any day leading up to our dying day can also be brighter because of who holds our future. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness hides his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. Uh, in every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Hope believes that tomorrow can be brighter, no matter how dark today may be. And the second thing is that hope 
depends upon us taking personal responsibility. We each have a say in how our lives unfold. We each have a say in how we approach society. There is the third option, as Crawford said this morning. There's not this side or that side. There's God's side. There's a third option. And the church needs to stand in the gap and take responsibility and act responsibly for creating a better tomorrow. The third part is agility. I can find multiple paths to achieve different goals. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And when I committed my way to him, when I trust in the Lord with all my heart, and I don't lean to my own understanding, I know that he will direct my path, but he will make my path straight. But here's the thing, not straight to my own personal goals, but straight to him because his purpose for me is to conform me to the character of his son. Sometimes in the process of conforming me to the character of his son, he doesn't allow me to get to the goals that I desire, but rather he replaces my desires with his desires. And sometimes the path he takes me down leads me to a juncture where I have to alter my course in order to see him more clearly. All of that takes in consideration the, the reality of the situation. I know that we're going to encounter obstacles. We have in the past. We will in the future. This will not be a smooth road for us to walk together. It's fraught with misunderstanding. It's fraught with, with challenges that, that, that go beyond our own experiences. Yet, as we strive to come together in brotherhood, then life changes, hearts change, and God begins to meld us together. Hope amplifies our desire to build a better tomorrow. And lastly, love multiplies. Love multiplies. By this will everyone know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. You know, the thing that I've walked away with today is it's not enough for us to talk about these issues. It's not enough for us to envision programs. We have to allow all of these conversations to sink deep within our hearts, to, to fill in the cracks in our character, to close the gaps between us and to begin to live together in brotherhood in love. When it comes to, to hope before it multiplies, if you'll allow me, I want to read um, a section from the book, then the book Hope Rises that I entitled One Race. And, and give me just a moment. I want to read this passage to you because I think it goes back and encapsulates the whole amplification of hope and the step over into love. For far too long, we've been a society ripped apart by people who have held the mistaken notion that the color of a person's skin has anything to do with his character. Racism in any form is a symptom of a sick society. It is a deadly virus transmitted through fear and hatred that attacks the mind and crushes the soul. It crushes the spirit and chokes the breath out of people. Once again, fear, frustration, and anxiety abound. And hopelessness is gaining a foothold on the American psyche. Peaceful protesters march in cities around the globe to ensure that justice prevails for all. Others with ill intent incite hatred and violence and self-serving idiocy minimizing the message, but the message must be heard and heeded. Life is valuable. Every life is important. Everyone deserves respect who respects others. Ethnicity may matter when it comes to your origin, but it shouldn't have nothing to do with your destiny. Your destiny is determined by character and choice in a free society. 
This is not a racial divide. It is a human divide. For we all are one race, the human race. There is no them, only us. We're all in this together. And this is the work of anti-racism. We must become better human beings so that we treat all human beings better. Tomorrow will be brighter than today, only if we strive to be better people and make better choices. Choices that show respect. Choices that reflect hope. Riots and violence will not shift the human heart for good. Raging and looting clearly demonstrate that such perpetrators have no dignity and show no respect for others and their property. These are the desperate acts of desperate people who lack hope. Hopeless people feel helpless. Helpless people feel unheard. They don't believe that tomorrow can be better, nor that they can make a difference. That makes hopeless people the most dangerous people in the world. They have nothing to live for, so they rail against. Because they're hopeless, they're willing to compromise their values to make a statement, even if it means taking advantage of and harming others. But violence only begets violence. We must stop this moral slide. We must restore dignity for our fellow man and respect one another. We must view all life as precious. We must pursue justice with a passion. We must diligently practice kindness. We must walk humbly together, hand in hand. We must listen. We must learn. We must see the world differently. Change will never come by rioting and railing against, but hope takes a stand for that which is valuable. Hope can bring healing to our broken land because hope acknowledges the problem. See, see, life gets messy. Truth is found in the messy middle where the screeches of extremism are silenced and hope can be birthed. Hope envisions a better tomorrow and crafts a plan to get there. Hope takes aggressive action without being the aggressor. Hope denounces evil while refusing to fall victim to its destructive clutches. Hope stands toe to toe with injustice and calls it out. Hope listens. Hope seeks understanding. Hope takes action to right wrongs. Hope seeks forgiveness. Hope offers grace. Hope crosses the divide and embraces a brother. It's okay. She's okay. Hope brings healing by standing on common ground. Hope finds a solution. Hope always discovers a way. Hope unifies humanity because hope knows that we are all one race. And hope knows that we are all one body, the body of Christ. By this will everyone know that, my, that you are my disciples if you love one another. So we, we are out to change the world by love. But how do you do that? Let me make one simple suggestion. It's something that someone shared with me quite some time ago, and it goes like this. Do for one person, just do for one, what you wish you could do for everyone. It's okay. She's and okay. you'll change the world for someone. I want to I wanna introduce you to my family. Here we are. Um, my wife and I are right there in the middle. And on my other side is my daughter, Lindsay. Um, I love them both. It's amazing. And then you see my three sons. 
Uh, on the left-hand side, beside my wife, is Ryan, our eldest son. And then beside him is our youngest son, Colton. And then on the other side, standing beside Lindsay, you'll see our third son. His name is Jonathan. Probably most of you figured out by now that we're somewhat of a blended family. <laughs> it didn't take too much to, to figure that out, but here's the reality. And here, here's the story in short. Nine years ago, a Jonathan came into our lives. And just to put it quite simply, he had a need. And God impressed upon us that we were to meet that need. And so we invited him to come into our home. And for the last eight some odd years, uh, Jonathan has been a member of our family. Um, he has brought us great joy. He has a smile that lights up the world. Uh, he has frustrated me to no end. I, I have been challenged in every way as a dad by him, just like I have my own sons but we have a great time together. Um, we would love to do for the entire world what we've done for Jonathan, but we can't. We have limited resources. But God impressed upon us to do for one person what we wish we could do for everybody. And if Jonathan were standing right here, he would tell you his world has been changed. But you know what? So has ours because of his investment and his influence in our lives. I've seen a young man grow into a, a stalwart individual that I know and believe can change the world. And it has been a joy for him to be a part of our family. We couldn't do it for everybody, but we could do it for him and God brought him across our path. As a matter of fact, just this last week, here's a picture of our kitchen. Um, this was actually Tuesday night uh, after basketball outside. The boys came in. It was burger night at our house. And you, you, know, you asked me the question, are you colorblind? And the answer is no. I'm not colorblind. I see black. I see pink. I see red. I see green shirts. I see a variety of colors. But if I look a little bit closer, you know what I see? I see young men. I see young men who need to come to understand the love of Jesus Christ. I see young men who need to come to understand that we're all in this together. I see young men who need a male role model in their lives to challenge them and encourage them to step up and shape the future and turn it into a brighter tomorrow. So in closing, I just want to remind you of the, the words of Micah. He has shown you, O oh mortal, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. If you want a challenge, here's my challenge to all of us, that we, we break out of our echo chambers, that we Quit talking only to people who mimic our ideas and regurgitate back to us what we want to hear. But we break out of our echo chambers of individuals who've only had life experiences that mirror our own. That we break out of our echo chambers and we begin to be challenged by having in-depth conversation with people who can influence us and see our, see things from a different perspective, that we can listen, that we can learn. Because it's impossible to have a conversation with ignorance wrapped in moral superiority. Ooh. And none of us can claim the moral high ground. We each have to walk humbly before our God because the reality is every single one of us was in need of redemption. And if we're ever going to get to that place that we demonstrate maturity by coming together in unity, it's going to require that we act justly and we love mercy. Ships don't sink because of the water around them. 
ships sink because of the water that gets in them. So don't let what's happening around you get inside you and weigh you down for faith allows you to float. It provides the, the buoyance to keep you above water. Hope, it anchors the soul so that you're not dashed against the rocks. But love keeps you on course to navigate a brighter tomorrow. And with this, I'll close. As I was reflecting upon what I wanted to share with you this week, faith, hope, and love, now these three abide. They imbue us with strength as we walk side by side. Love champions justice and will never be silenced. Love protects the least among us and can't condone violence. When it comes to responsibility, love does not deflect through diversity and inclusion. Love offers respect. We must become better people to treat people better and follow the spirit of the law and not just the letter. Love places a premium, not on some, but all lives. For love doesn't diminish, but instead multiplies. Faith must form the foundation for it unifies and hope brightens tomorrow as it amplifies. Add love is the expression of all that is true, and God closes the gap between me and you. That we would embrace our faith as the sole thing that unifies. That we would lean into hope as it amplifies our vision for tomorrow. Most importantly, we allow love to multiply for it's by our love for one another that the world will know that we're his. So my challenge is the same challenge that Paul gave us. Grow up, grow up. Without unity, there is no maturity. But when we embrace the fullness that is ours in Jesus Christ, we will be one body bound together. Family and friends, I pray that these three days have left you inspired to live into the change that God calls each and every one of us to be. We ask that as you continue to go forth each day in this year, 2021, ask yourself the question, where do I go from here? Where do we go from here? And as you ask yourselves that question, as we ask ourselves that question, I simply compel all of us to say, God, help me some way, somehow, live into your vision of beloved community. We pray that every day has led you to a point of revelation, that every day has yielded epiphanies, that every day has yielded a confidence and a belief that together we can indeed be the change that God wants us to be in the world as we live into visions of beloved community. So tonight, as you rest on your pillow, I ask that you receive this word of prayer to help us walk in that light that God calls us to walk in. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of love and life and light. We thank you for the gift of technology that allowed us to gather over these three days and be inspired by words and songs and stories and conversation that call us to live into beloved community. So tonight, God, take everything that we have received, make our hearts be good and fertile ground 
and let us reap the harvest of being the change you called us to be as you empower every single one of us to live into the gift of being beloved community. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Family and friends, go forth and be beloved.